The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Revex has experience in telecommunications, which is interesting, but has also worked and run a financial advice practice, but is actually here in his role as COO of an advice tech solution. So thank you so much for joining me on the show, Yul Hardik. My pleasure. Thank you. Warm introduction. (laughs) Well, we've got an easy win before we clobber you with the tough questions, right? So <laughs> catch you on a yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we're going to dive into Revex, which we will in a second. But we love um, in the Ensemble community to get to to know our guests uh, through their own use of technology uh, when we kick <laughs> off. So let's start with emojis. What is your most used emojis? Do you even use emojis? Yeah, I'm a fan of using emojis. Very quick and simple ways to express yourself. Uh, but I'd have to say my most used is the boring thumbs up, <laughs> and, uh, yep. which uh, I think is pretty common, the way to you know acknowledge that you understand something or agree with something. So, yeah, it'd be the thumbs up or the love hearts. I either yep. like what you're saying or I love it. That's pretty much <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's all about simplicity, right? Yeah. Um, so then, you know, we live with our smartphones, you know, permanently attached to us. I think some of us would actually have it permanently attached if it was possible. Um, if you had to wipe everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, which ones would you keep? Mm, three apps. Uh, two that I'd use on a on a daily basis that I'd probably uh, want to keep would be Airmail, uh, right. Which is a, an email application, just like okay. your email or your Apple Mail or whatever else. I just prefer yep. that one. It's a it's a paid app. It's got a lot more functionality. I can aggregate all my email accounts in there very easily. Nice. So Airmail would be one. Fantastical, which is a calendaring app. Yes, and, uh, you know, a, a paid replacement to the standard calendaring apps allows me to unify calendars across um, different accounts um, and has a bit more functionality and it syncs with my Mac and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and thirdly, would probably <laughs> probably have to be, dare I say, Candy Crush Soda. <laughs> I love. And kudos for admitting <laughs> that. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I was tempted to keep that one to myself, but I thought no. I'm giving you two boring ones, so I'll give you a fun one there. Absolutely. And you know what? It's um. Because I was reflecting the other day on what I would have to keep on my iPad, and for me, it's the Kindle app. Yeah, you know, yeah. I can I I'm a speed reader, so I devour books particularly quick, quickly. Oh, and I see, so, that's a good one. I think of that right. If we're and, talking and, about an iPad, it'd probably be Civilization Six, actually. So there you go. So I've got to go to on the iPad if I've got some downtime. Love a bit of game game gamification going on. I love it. Well, let's dive into Revix, shall we? So. 
I'm pretty confident most listeners uh, will have heard of you guys, but depending on where they've sat in practices or how new they are to the industry, they might not. So why don't we take it up to a high level first and just uh, give us a sense of where Revex sits in the sort of advice tech space. You know, what category does it generally fall under? Who do you generally get lined up against? Yeah. So Revex is essentially a revenue management system. Um, very much like uh, other players in the industry would include uh, your Compay, yep. uh, PayLogic, Feasley, uh, software or services of that nature. Uh, we're also a invoicing and, and client payments solution. Yep. We've got an integrated uh, client payments and client payment gateway option. Uh, we also have a rebates module. It's, it's a pretty fleshed out piece of software, but at its core, a revenue management system. Yeah, okay. And in terms of, you know, how it sort of came about, I'm betting that the initial problem it was solving was that, you know, one business, multiple providers, multiple commission statements, I mean, in the old days, of course, multiple commission reports or whatever coming from providers, how do we bring it together so we can make any, you know, headway on understanding this data? Is that fair? Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in the... In this industry, in this space, it's it's always been uh, a bit of the bane of an existence for a practice manager or a, a, a dealer group is managing all the fragmented commission statements you might get from various platforms and legacy yeah. platforms alongside with the move to you know, fee-for-service uh, models and being able yep. to integrate you know, direct fee uh, payment gateways and billing options, um, being able to track invoicing um, as well as revenue against insurance. Yep. But uh, probably more important over the past 10 or so years is uh, being able to provide accurate and compliant fee disclosure statements <laughs> or statements yep. of fees as they yep. were. You know, the industry has always been a bit up and down with these these uh, new, new and wonderful regulations. So uh, it's... Uh, I think an RMS has always been a necessary evil, but it's right. probably one of the most important components to running a compliant financial To be able to rely on it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, and I, I am you know, putting you on the spot here, but it's an interesting challenge we've all been faced, all the parties with fee disclosure, because- yeah. When you know the public hears that, they're like, "Well, you're disclosing your fees," and like we're all nodding, and well, of course. But you know, one of the interesting things, for example, for me that came out is the fee the client agrees is X dollars. The mm. fee they see from within their super platform could be X minus two dollars a month. The fee, like, <laughs> like, like, like the you know, so so Many in players. fact, uh, right, yeah. and and lack of clarity. Like yeah. it's just and and it's not, none of that is bad intent. That's the thing, right? It's just that you know mm. this platform decides they give the benefit of the you know credit due to to GST and other things, and but they net it or whereas the other platform decides no, we show the fee that's disclosed and then we do an ad back or like it's just <laughs> just no wonder oh, yeah. the public are uncertain, so right? Many, so many moving parts, you know, even yeah. the date on which a a, a client may pay a fee out of their account compared to the date it's it's actually paid to an advisor, compared to the date it's received to a bank account. Yeah. All these conflicting little things. Every platform seems to have their own way of calculating, you know, the RITC on on fees in super and all these sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So if it was just a dollar-for-dollar equation, you probably wouldn't even need an RMS because it'd be straightforward. But right. I guess right. To our advantage. Yeah. <laughs> there are so many layers from the platform, the dealer group or licensee, the practice, and then the advisor, and then the client. There are many moving parts, and having a system that that helps keep all of that in check, organised, structured, yeah. and the ability to tidy up and link it to other data and all sorts of things is yeah. a huge advantage. And you know, while we're sort of on that topic, I am a bit curious about what, you know, you guys might be seeing in terms of, I mean, years ago, the number of advice practices that might direct bill a client could probably yeah. be counted on one hand yeah. or, or maybe two. Um, yeah. But I'm guessing 
that that figure is is Look, changing significantly over time, that you guys are seeing far more practices direct charging just because of, well, perhaps because that dynamic is changing and they're more comfortable with that, but also because it's taking out a layer of complexity. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's still a mix across the board. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'd wager that most businesses are still taking platform-based fees in some yeah. form or another. Uh, but there are a number that have moved solely to fee-based or fixed-term contracts, billing the client directly, uh, or a combination of both. Some, you know, yeah. for some items, perhaps one-off fees for the, you know, creation and presentation of an SOA or some specific piece of advice can be billed directly to a credit card or by a direct debit to the client. Um, yeah. Other things are invoice but paid via the platform or through a yep. vehicle such as a self-managed super fund or, or whatever else, yep. which, you know, at the end of the day, as long as the client is aware of the fees, where they're coming from and have consented yep. to it, Revex as a software allows that to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, to, a, to our credit, we recognised that these were some of the moves happening in the industry and we've- yep built Rebex, developed Rebex and continue to develop those parts of Rebex specifically to accommodate what we think the future of a statement of fees, you know, client disclosure yeah. um, and 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 all that will, will eventuate. Will look like. Yeah. yeah, will look like. yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious actually for you too internally because, um, and there's a few system sort of categories like this in the industry where um, you almost sort of have two masters in that, um, you know, there could be a own AFSL dealer group, sorry, um, business that you're dealing with, practice. So that's, you know, sort mm. of linear and that's that's great. But then you will also have a relationship with a dealer group that then has practices underneath that. And, and while the requirement, there's lots of overlap, I'm curious how you balance you know, the demands or even the development dem demands between the two? Like is, you know, it, it's some of oh, them, they're yeah. going to need different things, right? And so it's, I'm curious how that works internally and, and you know, how that's evolved. And I'm, I'm guessing that perhaps there's been a bit of a shift to a bit more attention on the individual practices only because there's more and more of, yeah. you know, boutique um, AFSLs going on, you know, that's becoming um, yeah. sort of more consistent. So, I mean, so how do you, you guys manage that internally in terms of the demands on the future of, you know, Revex? Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. There are sort of – and we catered to both. I mean, mm. uh, Revex is – I think you're, you're still not allowed to say independent, but we're agnostic in terms of the technology stack we work with. Yeah. Um, and I think that has certainly appealed to – uh, the boutique AFSLs yep. um, in Australia. But we yep. cater to, you know, all sizes. We've got big dealer groups and we've got small self-licensed people. Um, but the two types of users, the two power users or groups of users we have in Rebex would be those licensee level users mm -hmm. who are generally the recipients of all the commission statements, the recipients of all the data, the bank transactions, and have to work their magic to marry all that data together uh, yep. and, and basically present it for, you know, on payment or deduction of fees and whatever else down the track. Uh, yep. So it's the licensee level users that are the data wranglers, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, the sort of more emergent users in the Revex space, uh, the practice managers, the advisors, the people who log in want to look at the revenue per advisor, per client, want to go in and create invoices or yep. charge a fee to a client or get, you know give a client an email to pay their bill, but also business intelligence. You know, right. it's almost everyone we talk to lately is is just on the bandwagon about business intelligence and data analytics. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, you know, at, at a dealer group level, obviously that's that's important. The licensees uh, want that data as well, but the practices and the advisors need it. They yes. need it. Yes. So, you know, in, in terms of the the power users, the licensees are the data wranglers. They get it in there. They get it clean. They make the payments. Uh, the advisors and the practices are the ones that want the reporting, the extensive access to their data, and the integrations with other layers in the tech stack. And certainly our development is is catering towards both. We're constantly fleshing out integrations with other 
CRMs, for example, yep. uh, and certainly uh, improving our reporting module and, and fleshing out our API to enhance the possibility of better information, better enabled advisors in putting together their own reporting, their own business intelligence, um, and better serving their clients ultimately with real live structured data. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's an interesting, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting evolution of these things where you know some years ago, <clears throat> a lot of this, I guess, data was the the advisor or the practice was a sort of passive recipient, if you know what I mean. Like it was just mm. this is just a summary of where the income's coming from. Like it was sort of just a, you know, it was quite a passive su- yeah, uh, summary of information. So this is what I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Job done. You know, until next month or whenever yeah. it comes through. Um, yeah. But you know, the sort of things now that are becoming more real is. If you've got a direct fee, and it might be, say, monthly fee, you know, being able to have flags such that if something happens and, you know, the payment drops off or it's or it's somehow broken, you know, that, that connection then, you know, yeah. not finding out when you do a review in nine months. You know, it's this sort of stuff is evolving into a different way we've, we're all going to have to operate. And like you say, that we're going to have to have our systems talk to each other so that then those flags can be raised, you know? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. And I think that sort of the, the fragmentation in the industry in terms of every platform having their own format for a re- revenue statement or a commission statement uh, paired with the need for advisors to be able to charge clients directly through some sort yeah. of payment gateway or you know flesh yeah. out an invoice where the client can click a link and basically self-directed update their credit card or direct debit authority, those sorts of things yeah. are becoming essential. The yes. like Stripes or Chargifiers or you name it, these sorts of subscription management solutions that that have been around for other industries for I know, a for long our, time <laughs> are now yeah. uh, essential parts of any financial planning practice and need to be integrated into that larger fragmented structure. So on that front, actually, um, let's imagine uh, there's a practice out there, they're uh, in the throes of building a wonderful um, cash flow coaching program, one to many. It's going to be a nine-month sort of program, and they've decided to spread that cost for the attendees over, say, nine months um, for a monthly amount. So it's it's this term, you know, nine-month spread um, almost to buy the program, like you do all sorts of other things where we learn email marketing or we learn, you know, all these things we buy online that can be a, a charge for a certain mm-hmm. amount. Is that something that um, can be set up within RevX now or is it something you guys are working towards? Uh, yes. Yes, we do that at the moment. So we've got okay. the ability to create, um, we call them ongoing plans in RevX. Yep. Yep. Other industries would call it sort of a subscription. Subscription or, yep. Or, yep. or you know, ongoing service uh, fee, that sort of thing. Yep. Um so, in, yeah, absolutely. In, in RevX, anything from a fixed-term contract to an open-ended contract for whatever service can be built into RevX, clearly specified. Email the client copy of the invoice, uh, say if it's, you know, a couple of hundred dollars each month, sends right. them the invoice each month. They've got okay. the opportunity to update their payment details if there's a connected payment gateway through our APay module. Yep. Uh, and the client can can manage it directly. If oh. If the advisor is sitting down with the client and has has the time and the patience, they can enable the client to update the details there and then in the right. office. But I think in yeah, today uh, the most accepted form is to email a secure link and right. and let the client do it in their own time. A hundred percent. And I mean, I'm hoping everybody out there is the last thing I want to be doing is collecting details I don't need of somebody's, yeah. you know, whether it's their credit card or their, like, you know, none of us want it. No, all no, bad. No, gone but just- people would send their credit card information over an email or you're collecting it over the phone. But Big that's nothing, the thing, right? Today. It's yeah. it's just, it's, it's um yeah, it's, it's fraught with danger. So I'm with you. If there's something that's set it up and then the client can, can go away and, and set up that payment and off they go, you know, that's there's a level of liberation to that that I think is probably a bit untapped in the industry. I think we probably haven't quite co- quite got to the point where lots of people are doing that because we're so used mm. to it being via product, even if it is a fixed dollar. Um, we're so used to doing it that way that we're not seeing these other opportunities necessarily. Um, so yeah. I think- and We're you know, still sort of in that transition phase too of yeah. still using platforms. 
you know. Right. And admittedly, if if uh, you charge a fee through a platform, you can still marry it up to an invoice charged through Revex. Yep. Um, but certainly, it does seem like the missing piece has yeah. been uh, a, a payment gateway integrated client billing solution specifically for advisors, which is why we built our APay module in the first place. Okay. Yeah. And you're right. It's something that's been around, well, ages elsewhere. In um, other industries, yeah. Yeah. Every time you buy anything really online, you're going through a, a payment gateway. I mean, as a rule, I'm generalizing there, but that's yeah. really how well, – so really it's just a a way for clients to directly interface with a, a you know, yeah, yeah. a money collection facility. So I've seen some businesses using Zero to invoice their clients and whatever else to, um, and linking that up to a Stripe or, or whatever else. Uh, yep. But it does get complicated for AFSLs because you sort of have two levels of, of payments and receipts if you're paying yes. multiple advisors or multiple practices, uh, yep. as well as dealing with billing for the clients of said advisors and practices. Uh, it does require a, a special set of uh, tools to manage that properly. Yeah, and then in terms of um, in terms of then you were talking about integrations with CRMs and and look we're all on that journey aren't we about um, yeah. real integration as opposed to token push of data one way or the other. Um, then before we dive into what they are and I think that would be you know something we should definitely cover. I'm mm-hmm. curious as you guys have have gone down that path. Is there any lessons of, you know, what practices are better prepared from that from their data end? Like, has there been any work that, you know, on the practices side they've had to do to make that worthwhile or make it, you know, really valuable as opposed to, oh, we've got the integration. Oh, but crap, our data is not good enough. It's not going to, like, we've got some work to do. Is there any sort of insights that you could bring on that front? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it's probably not unusual in this industry to have, unclean data somewhere, whether it's yeah. in your your CRM of choice uh, or in uh, your RMS or, you know, a, an email campaign manager, it's, it's not uncommon to have unclean data. And a lot of the reason that data isn't clean is because it's never been properly integrated or connected with other data. Or right. in terms of if you have to move data from one uh, layer of your tech stack to another, um, it requires a number of steps that that can either make it a little bit too hard yep. or too difficult yep. to uh, to to get it cleaned and and correct. And that's not a new problem. That's been a problem for ten, fifteen years. Yeah, uh, the industry has always battled with the the the, f- the freedom of of their data and being able to yep. access it uh, on their own terms. But one thing I think. That is a big advantage with Rebex is that we have a very focused core mission, and that is to be the best of breed in the RMS space in the Australian yeah. market. We don't want to be a CRM. We don't want to be anything other than focusing on revenue management and client billing and advisor payments, that whole brokerage commissions space. That's our sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's certainly value in staying focused on something specifically, you know, that old Steve Jobs mentality. Don't don't try and do everything because you'll do it half yeah. as well. The one thing yeah. you do is actually good. Yeah. And that's certainly the, the focus with Revex. And the advantage for us there is that we can be agnostic. We work with everyone in the landscape. Mm. We work with, uh, with Iris. We work with uh, PlutoSoft. We work with... In Teleflow, more recently, um, we just want to deliver the best of breed solutions to our clients. Yeah, and part of that, you know, my frustration, I think, from from uh, previous lives gone by, is that uh, as as a bit of a nerd myself, I've always wanted to use the best software, the the world best option for any particular piece, it be it uh, you know a, a Mailchimp or something for email yep. uh, campaign management. Um, to maybe Salesforce for a CRM, you know, all these different things, but they would never play well with each other. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yep. it's always a challenge. You know, you can, yep. in your mind, you can create the perfect tech stack and say, I'll use this for that. I'll use Revex for an RMS, blah, blah, blah. 
and then you go and try and plug it together. And unless you're a developer yourself, the yeah. whole thing starts to become a little bit bigger than Ben Hur. Yeah. But I think that challenge has not been unique to me. It's certainly been a frustration echoed around the industry for over a decade. And it's coming to a point now where the competitive advantage for any layer in that tech stack is how well it talks to other software. Yeah. Uh, and that's certainly a focus for Rebex. We just want to be an RMS. We're focused on being the best possible RMS and client payments and advisor payment solution in the space. And that is largely driven on our integration with the other layers in the tech stack. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it's um we're all talking about it now and it's certainly a a key element of I mean it's it's a category that I've got on my little list of questions. You know, it's a whole category is integration in in advice tech and yeah. what we're covering when I interview people. But but mm. like you say, um when you look at the amount, when you sit back and sort of watch your practice from afar and you see how much time, energy, and in particular frustration occurs because of the lack of integration, it becomes, I mean, you become a bit religious about it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. It becomes an obsession because that's not what I'm actually paying them for. You know, like that's not actually why they're there. And it's not actually this. I mean, these are wonderful people that work for all of us and they should be doing the wonderful thing of engaging with our clients and getting them great outcomes. And instead they're sitting there ready to throw their computer across the room oh. because of the lack of it talking to other systems, you know, and, and, you know, that stuff. I'm, I'm right there with you. So on that point, then for you guys, I'd imagine. There's this sort of big regular plays, like you mentioned there, that you sort of naturally integrate with it because you'd have a lot of users mm -hmm. that do that. If there's a CRM that's that's a bit further down the list or it's less popular, how does that work for you guys? How can somebody then try and get an integration for something that's a little more unusual? Yeah. Again, yeah, the advantage to us is we're, we're, we're not owned by any particular CRM and we're and, you know, a small to medium-sized business, so we can be relatively – uh, quick and agile to yep. jump on opportunities in the market. You know, we've got a very flexible and talented development team. Awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, if um, if we're onboarding a client who has something we haven't encountered before, a CRM that's new to the market or, or, uh, or you know, a different uh, method of um, payment gateway or, or yep. whatever it is, we're pretty quick to adapt and develop an integration. That being said, I think we've probably been exposed to almost everything that's out there yeah. to date. Um, so we've got oh, a pretty a clear idea. I'm hearing a challenge, listeners. <laughs> I'm hearing a challenge. <laughs> yeah, email me a little later. I'll let you know. Yeah, you know, ultimately, the the whole point is we want to be the the best at what we do in terms of yeah. revenue management, providing um, payment options for advisors, and the emergent need of those that practice level user needing better access to data, better reporting, business intelligence, integrated yeah. payment options. Those are the things that are driving a lot of our current development. Yeah. And similarly, it's what other layers in that tech stack, CRMs or whatever else, other businesses are getting the exact same feedback from their clients. Yeah. So I think we're coming to a bit of a golden age in terms of technology in the financial advice industry because yes. we're moving away from the horizontally integrated offerings yep. to uh, being very focused on it's the advisor's data, no more black box systems. Everyone's fleshing out their API offerings. And I mean that everyone in the industry is trying to develop some sort of open API architecture to better yep. integrate because it is the competitive advantage that will ensure the survival of any layer in that tech stack over the yeah. next five to ten years, and we're definitely uh, ahead of the curve on that piece, I think. And it's a um, – what's interesting is is probably revenue management has been um, – I, well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would have I would have thought from a practice perspective, it's been a bit further down the list in terms of us sort of focusing on that demand, like going, hey, we want it to integrate. But mm -hmm. when I think about it, the data you guys uh, collect and, and collate is mm. has far less dimensions than a lot of the data that is elsewhere. So, so really, it it only falls into a couple of categories per client. You know, so each client can only have a couple. Of, like, there's yes, there's complexity to it. I'm not. Mm. 
un- underrating that, but it's more the volume of the data that's the issue as opposed to the number of headings, if you get what I mean. Whereas some of the other integrations, yeah. I can understand why it's a bit tough because it's like, wow, there's a lot of potential columns yeah. in that thing. You know, like it's like, wow, it can be all sorts of things and all sorts of activities. Whereas um, yeah. for all, there's a lot of volume. It's like, you know, it could be monthly payments on a premium or all sorts of things that come through yeah. really you know, the dimensions are quite are quite um, limited, which is a positive. You know, that means that integration is possible um, because you're not trying to jam, you know, a round peg into a, a octagonal hole. So it's, um, I think that's. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Uh, but yeah. that being said, like we spoke about earlier, the fragmentation in the delivery of this information from platforms and the like. Yeah. That is the layer of complexity. You know, Correct. And I guess that's my uh, yeah. point is is you guys are doing a whole lot of hard work for the, for the data in. You know, that's that's mm. where a lot of the hard work for, you, for you, you know, your solution comes from. Whereas what we haven't really, I think, gotten onto is the, the next step, which is the data out, you know, mm. or, or connected to us, maybe isn't the massive leap in our heads we thought it was, you know. And so that's why we've pushed it down the list when I think maybe, you know, we should all be focusing on it a bit more to get real advantage of that granular insight. Um, yeah, absolutely. That, that we may not be getting I, right now. We're, we're really coming into an age where I think, you know, the likes of the online services like Power BI in Microsoft or Tableau, these uh, analytics and data aggregation softwares are becoming very accessible to end yeah. users. And we've got a generation of advisors and practice managers and dealer group CEOs coming through now that have a lot more technology now than mm. previous generations. Yeah. So the solutions are becoming better scoped and more defined. Correct. And ultimately, these software providers like Revex and, and the CRMs out there and whoever else to cater to those needs. Yeah. Or else the market will go and develop their own. Correct. Because it's becoming a very much a possibility, right? Yeah. And I think you know, you're right. I think it's um our ability these days to enunciate what we want is clearer yeah. because we're exposed to more options, even if it's not in our industry. We're like, yes, but you know, the way it works when I do that, you know, mm. whether it's buying and uh, you know an outfit or it's whatever like, like that seems to work. Can we do that here? You know, like it's yes. we're exposed to much more of it now. So I'm, I agree. I think our our ability to scope in that sense, and certainly from a practice, you know, maybe a practice manager level, they're getting so good at granular process understanding that mm. the ability to say, I need those things to do this four times, and then that, <laughs> and this is how yes. you know, like and just the, the volume of data now that seems to be flowing across people's desks, yeah, uh, is is creating a lot of uh, what would you call it spreadsheet fatigue. Yes. You know, most practice managers are pseudo advanced Excel users that yeah. uh, at some point uh, they just get fatigued and say, there's got to be an yeah. easier way to do this. There's only so yeah. many power queries or pivot tables I can create. Before, Correct. Like you said, I want to fall in half. <laughs> Correct. Now, let's talk about um, you've got a whole lot of people on um, RevX and users uh, and maybe focus on it at a practice level. Are there any mm-hmm. features or services you guys sort of have as part of the package that you find you know, maybe doesn't get taken advantage of but you think is a bit of a gem? Like is there anything that really like, ooh, people should look under the hood there because there's, mm. there's some magic that they could take advantage of? Yeah, look, we've – you know, we've got, we've got quite a number of uh, licensees of all sizes as clients uh, and and a huge number of practices. And everyone seems to you know, have their own favourite piece or their own flavour. Mm. In, in my opinion, a couple of the unsung heroes of the, the Revex software would be what makes it a little bit more than just an RMS. And that would right. be what we call our APay and Pay My Bill modules. Yep which is effectively catering to people who create those ongoing invoices or fixed-term contracts or yep. or one-off fees and program those schedules into Rebex right. uh, and have it connected to a payment gateway so that's all seamlessly integrated. It eliminates the need for having to import you know, these fragmented statements from various suppliers as well right. because it automatically matches. Right. Um, Perfect. Because it's all driven through Rebex. Yeah. Uh, and – you know, I, I certainly think it's it's the only one of its kind in the Australian market today that does that for the financial advisor space. And okay. the people who use it swear by it. The people who don't use it probably just don't know about it yet. Yeah. 
another area I haven't seen too much of it, but uh, rebating clients. Yep, uh, it's it's a functionality we've we've uh, built into into Rebex the ability to rebate clients and to manage that process and the payments and so forth uh, directly in in the Rebex software. You, yeah. know, you create the ABA file, you upload it to your bank, and it splits out the payments just like you would for advisor payments or okay. staff payments, those sorts of things. There hasn't been too much demand for that. I don't think many businesses are really looking at that, but the ones that yep. do swear by it. Obviously, yep. it's, it's more of an ethics concern or a business yes. thing, um, and we do it. Yeah, okay. And, you know, if there were businesses that were looking at delivering client rebates, that is, for example, rebating everything that's paid by our platform and billing yep. the client directly yep. through um, through APAY, uh, it's it's a feature that we currently have, and I would like to see more utilization of it, especially for businesses that have been thinking about moving to a pure fee for service model. Right. Uh, and the client direct billing engagement is definitely something we've been running and can accommodate. And that's an interesting tool to have, um, you know, if somebody's transitioning to that, because there's always that middle ground where some of it has been the old way and some's the new way. And, you know, like it's, it can always get a bit messy. So to have that facility there such that either way in Mm. that transition you're covered um, can make a big difference uh, because it can get messy truly. But like you say, you know, this provider, you give them notice here, but there's still two payments that come through or then like, like all that stuff can just be. Yeah, like yeah. so messy. So to have a way that you know we we'd know that we could rebate and that would all be handled. That's that's a um that's really positive. Yeah, um, it's massive, and it's just something that can that can become a little bit uh, complicated, which is oh, why yeah. and it hasn't been a popular path for many businesses because yep. uh, they, uh, the the complexity of managing something like that. Does yep. need some bespoke tools, uh, but they're yep. tools that we have. So if there's anyone out there wanting to rebate clients, jump on board. I suppose that yep. also leads to what we we're talking about before around fee disclosure statements or statements mm-hmm. of fees and whatever that'll turn out to be over the next five or ten years. Yeah. Uh, and I've had the the great fortune of seeing uh, various implementations of fee disclosure statements, statements of fees and and the like across many yep. different dealer groups and how they're managed. None of them are ever very easy to administer no. or pull together. <laughs> but, in, you know, and this is probably more of a personal opinion, I, I look at uh, something like Revix and I think, well, all the data really is in Revix and I'd like to see probably more use of Revix for producing fee disclosure statements and statements of fees because that's the source of the data. Right. In Rebex, it, to me, it just makes sense to cleanly develop the client-facing statements of fees yep. out of the software that holds the data. Yep. Um, that being said, you know, we talked about integration before. We do. We integrate with almost all the CRMs to produce options to generate FDSs out of other softwares as well. Yep. Um, but I do think it's more of an RMS concern than anything else, and I would like to see that that develop over time as well. We have an FDS option inside of Revix, and uh, and you know we're actively developing that to to accommodate whatever direction businesses go in in terms of being able to produce statements of fees. Yep. Um, but it's always it's always top of mind. That's, <laughs> you know, it's what's driven regulation over the past ten years. I think being able to clearly define the fees you've collected, when they were collected, what they were collected for with clients. So it's yeah. not going away anytime soon. No, it's not. I do think that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about is because there's there's a second half of that activity, which is then, you know, renewal or consent. Oh, um, yeah. And and right now, uh, we're very much at the mercy of every platform, assuming, sorry, that that fee is paid out of a platform, uh, then we're very much at the mercy of the platform. And so, there's mm. rumblings I'm hearing that's very early stages of people trying to get to the point where, and I'll use you guys as an example, where in fact the FDS slash consent that got generated um, would let you know would end up having a button the client could say yes and I agree that I'd like to continue for twelve months and that then that would then push to the product provider like the yeah, sure. the direction would be the other way you know and it'd say. Yes, the client's continuing. You know, it's not for new stuff. I get that for a new, a brand new fee or a change to the fee, mm-hmm. 
forms and all that rigmarole is required, I get it. But if there's something in place and all the client is saying, yes, please continue, <laughs> mm. then it, it makes a lot of sense that that would actually be pushed to the provider from one place as opposed to us individually doing these ridiculous forms and like it's 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 oh. all a bit it's sort of a bit embarrassing to be honest the whole the rigmarole that goes into all of that like yeah, lots yeah. of clients are just really this seems really hard i'm like it really is you know <laughs> this is yeah, this is yeah. this is a bit silly like, so a piece of paper and, and all the rest of it yeah. and i think you know Platforms, access to APIs for platforms is going yes. to be a big thing over the next couple of it years. It is. To some extent, it's already a thing overseas. Yep. Um, you know, even in terms of revenue management, instead of getting these ridiculous CSVs or PDFs emailed across every so often or downloading out of a website and having to upload that into RMS, yeah, connect straight to the source and suck that data straight out of a, a platform's database. I mean, th- yep. those are things where... where you know, that are on our radar and we're talking to platforms about it at the moment. Um, and I know Iris have a project as well, which for similar reasons, they want to be able to direct things out of out of X-Plan, you know, yeah. um, feed payments via platforms and whatever else. Right. But it's got to be a broader market engagement. If platforms yeah. want to be the, um, you know, the ones that charge a fee, take a fee and pay out the fee. Yeah. Uh, that sort of integration with an RMS and a payments gateway like Revex is crucial. Yeah, it is. Sure. Has to be integrated. Yeah. And it's what's interesting too is um, you know, we're in the game of finance and it's sort of hysterical mm. that the information on our own business's finance is only historical in that we only really get it after it's happened. Like it's no. it's like surely in finance oh, yeah. we'd have a more night because at like you're saying, if if we all got better at that and it was more of a sort of a live feed, which is sort of what you're saying, right? It'd be more of a, a, a live interconnection. Then yeah. cash flow for advice practices and being able to, you know, manage that, but it would suddenly transform the way you could run a business because it's not after the fact and gee, I wonder why that particular payment was half what it was last time. Like it's it's all sort of unknown right now. Like it's whereas being able to, you know, see that and, you know, a smart tool using a bit of AI perhaps would be able to predict that and go, oh, wait a minute, in three weeks we reckon there's going to be something there that's a bit unusual. Let's, you know, like it would be preemptive. Um yeah. which would be fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, you know, you you already see that a little bit with tools like My Prosperity and and the like, where they connect directly to the bank account, and you can create some rules around categorizing transactions, yep. budgeting, and and whatever else. But it, it certainly needs to be something that's applied to the revenue management space in financial services in general, not just financial planning. Like broking is no. another area. General but insurance, I'm sure, is the same. It's, of yeah. some some technological advancement. Yeah. But uh, ultimately, these are areas where, you know, the platforms, if they want to continue to stay relevant, and I'm sure they will, need to be engaging with the technology stack directly. Yeah. And vice yeah. versa. Yeah. And just see it as part of a given. If you're going to play in this space, this is how we do it. Yeah. No is there anything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Is there anything else looking forward that you guys have got on the development plan or you've sort of got on the radar that's going to be, you know, coming up that you'll either add into the suite or, or upgrade or change it? Yeah, as we were talking about, I mean, we've we've covered off a lot in this talk, actually. Mm. But, uh, some of the key things on our development pipeline at the moment are further fleshing out our integration options. So yep. being able to deploy our API and, you know, connect it with anyone who's willing quite easily. Yep. Um, in terms of being able to deliver uh, business intelligence at a practice level, a dealer group level, and whatever else, and to just to be able to use that RevX data however you want. It's your yep. data. However you <laughs> want to use it, go for it. You know, we're, we're all for that open interconnectedness. Um, and also working with other layers in that tech stack, be that CRMs, uh, be that um, various you know marketing or campaign management softwares, or whatever opportunity we can to make this data more useful to businesses, yep. we we want to be engaging in that space. Yeah. So we're actively working to, to make that a lot easier. Um, there's also, uh, we've done quite a bit of work in that integration with payment gateways space to create a fleshed out 
we call it the aid pay module inside mm-hmm. of Revix so that you can create these ongoing plans, these invoices, and manage all of that from one place. Uh, awesome. And obviously, the reconciliation piece there is much easier because the data goes out from Revix, comes straight back into Revix, it matches against itself, it's a piece of cake. Um, So I'd really like to think that um, over the next year or so, we'll have a number of big announcements on enhancements in that area too. Awesome. Um, Well, we'll we'll wait with bated breath to hear about those down the track for sure. Is is there any of the features we've missed? I mean, I know there's also, um, I'm aware you guys also have like, so currently for the listener that doesn't understand, you know, there's all these files that come through in terms of revenue, we've got to load them up, all this sort of process. My understanding is you guys can also take on some of that. So if somebody just wants to go, hey, I need you to upload and, and get all of that done, that's something that Revex can do for a practice if they choose to to sort of take that extra step. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So Revex, Revex is a software, you know, separate to that, we've got our Com Central business, which is uh, outsourced brokerage services. Yeah, okay. Uh, Whether the you know, business is using Revex or Compay or whatever whatever the software solution, Com Central's agnostic. Obviously, we prefer Revex. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to twist your arm because yep. it's your choice. Yep. Um, uh, but yeah, we absolutely have a, a an option to alleviate that burden in businesses as well because brokerage has become quite a science today. Uh, so we, we definitely have a, a team of experts that can look after that internally as well. Perfect. Anything else we've missed? I feel like we've covered most of the... It's been lovely. Not trip. at all. Not at all. You are very welcome. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Revex, then the website link is in the episode show notes. You know how this works. Um, but along with Yule's LinkedIn details, now I'm sure he's not actually the person that's going to be answering your queries, but he can probably point you towards the person that can. Um, so reach out and, and ask. And remember, he challenged us to um, find a CRM that, that they're not yet connected to. So I feel like we need to, you know, help him out there and send some suggestions through. Exactly. Go on. Um, Thank you so much for joining me here today and sharing how you guys are playing. I know it's possibly an unsexy part of advice tech, but it's fundamental to us all being able to keep the doors open. So thank you so much for (laughs) sharing your insights. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks so much, you Okie dokie, this revenue management stuff, huh? We've had a couple of episodes now on this. Um, So, you know, after the homework from last week, have you worked out um, what what your practice is using? Are they a Revex user? Are they a Feasley user, one of the other providers? You know, make sure you know, find out what what system they use and perhaps even do some digging into what features are being used within the business. Because while um, I fully understand that, you know, practice managers and maybe the dealer groups um, are actively doing that work for you, perhaps, it is worth understanding what's possible. So whatever tool you've got, understanding what's possible, understanding that perhaps um, you can set up a six-month direct debit for a particular program somebody's going on or or something for their, you know, adult kids that you're going that they can register them for. Or like there's all these tools we have um available to us that don't require us now, as it sounds, to have other payment ga- gateways, other ways we're going to have to organize that. So do the digging, ask the questions, um, offer to understand better those systems just so you can understand what data you've got, what opportunities you have, and and how things might work in your practice. Um, also, but you know, if you've come across something wonderful or a great way of using the tool, or gee, this thing does FDS is really well, please share it on the Ensemble pl- platform. You know, we've got to crowdsource this stuff. Um, you know, it's it's truly invaluable from here to hear from another practitioner, and it could be a support person who said, "Actually, I worked out how we can do this particular nuanced thing in our practice. Share it, please." Um, the more we all do that, then the more we can truly lift up uh, the the industry as a whole and and just get really humming in the way that we can engage with the public. Now, in terms of my thoughts. Um, about our conversation there, something that sort of stood out for me is, is well, look, it's an unsexy topic again. <laughs> Here we go, Peter, uh, which is, you know, data, quality of data uh, and how we handle that in our practices. Uh, this is something that 
uh, often we can get very grouchy and focused on when we are moving systems, for example, um, or trying to integrate systems, but it's not something we're generally aware of as we go along. Uh, whereas I would encourage you to consider data quality an ongoing uh, mandate that's set within the practice. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, with something you could go and dig into maybe your Coursera and whatever you use, go and find the mobile phone field and see how many different ways people are entering that in. Are they entering? And it depends on the CRM. Some of them won't let you do it but any, any but one way. But for some of them, some people are going to enter them four numbers space, three numbers space, three numbers space. Some are going to enter them all in one big long number. Some are going to enter them as plus six, one, four, one, two, right? <laughs> if you've got multiple ways that your team are entering data into the one field, then you're going to need a data mandate, something that just says for these key fields, this is the way we enter that data. Yeah. And what's going to happen as you start to become aware of this is you're going to see how many places the one thing can be represented in six different ways. Um, and those things may seem small and they are until you need them not to be, until you're trying to connect to something else. And, you know, on the mobile phone front, if you want to have automated SMSs coming out of the system as follow-ups or click to call because you've put all of the calls into cloud computing and you want it to click and then the phone just starts ringing for the you know, the individual maybe working from home or, or even in the practice using cloud phone systems, then that only works when that data is really clean. Um, and if it's not clean, that's when it causes hiccups in these wonderful productivity and efficiency gains. So, you know, just start to look, use the mobile feed as, as an example, um, but there'll be other fields where there just simply isn't consistency in the way uh, your team are utilizing them or the information they put in. Um, this is the first layer is those really sort of specific fields like a mobile number, date of birth, those things that, are, that have construct. The second layer of, you know, data mandates is how you use some of the text fields that you have in your practice. And, you might have um, some fields that you're typing things in, but some people are using it for one word notes and some people are using it for long sentences and something like, you know, the more you become aware of that, the better quality the data you're going to have. Um, it's going to be far more clean, which means it's far more useful down the track and you're going to be able to trigger and, and engage with it in all sorts of ways. So that's sort of my mission for you is start to become aware of everything in your CRM and the fact that it is an opportunity to be data that can be analyzed and collated and use it to trigger things later. So start with the mobile field. Just go and check it out. Maybe in your practice and your CRM, it's not an issue. So look for another field where you think, oh, hold on, that looks like people are entering that different ways and just start considering that and debating it in the team. Now, for today's Curiosity Corner discussion, I've actually got something a little different uh, for you to take a look at. I uh, accidentally came across this website, um, and website is an exaggeration. It's really just a landing page, um, but it's basically been set up to represent the wealth of the super rich shown to scale. So that people can get a sense of, you know, if you're, if you're Bezos, if you're these, these, you know, Bill Gates, what does that mean? compared to the rest of us? What is what does that actually mean? And, you know, what could they potentially be doing with it? So the website is called One, number one, Pixel Wealth. And the best way to find it is just to Google One Pixel, P-I-X-E-L, Wealth. Uh, we'll also include the link in the show notes. Uh, so if you're out and about driving and you can't write that down, uh, the link will be in the show notes. But you know, all, I mean, really this website itself is all about highlighting wealth inequality, right? And, and that's what the messages embedded in it are all about. But I'd love you to take a look at it as a really interesting example of how with a relatively, actually really simple graphic and way of representing something, you can get across a message that actually holds a fair bit of complexity and nuance and has a lot of views and storytelling underneath it, you know, and it's a topic that I think lots of consumers actually struggle to grasp or get their heads around, you know, how wealthy are the uber wealthy and what does that actually mean? And why does that make them want to build rocket ships? I'm just being, just kidding. Um, but <laughs> I'm being cheeky there, but you know, I just wonder whether as advisors, 
we could start to think about what great insights we could give the pub- public if we could put together some imagery like this that could help them understand concepts, um, whether that's compounding, whether that's you know these things that we see as fundamental and that would help them really get a grasp of a core truth. You know, is there a way we could do that with some cleverness and sense of humor um, and a simple graphic uh, representation. And when I say graphic, I don't mean graph, right? This is about graphic as in a, a drawing that captures something. So uh, I challenge you to check it out. Like I said, one pixel wealth. Um, but, you know, as you're looking and having a bit of fun with it um, and just notice how simple it is, uh, how it's getting across messages, and then think about what could we do similarly on a different topic that could be incredibly valuable for the people we interact with. Welp, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you feel like, you know, your practice is sort of stuck in a rut on the processes you have and the and the tech projects you think you need going forward, maybe you feel a need to step back and do some planning for the year ahead, then I'd love to facilitate a brainstorming session for your team on sort of drawing out the next best projects for the business, maybe what tech could assist you with those projects and then we can, you know, get the team all working together to innovate in an ongoing sense within the practice. So if that sounds something that's just right for you right now, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 